So um, let's move over to our second speaker, uh, Uri Shadit. Um, and he is, uh, so he's, he's assistant professor at uh, Israel Institute of Technology. And he was before in the US. He's going to talk about uh, extreme domain adaptation, uh, an early COVID-19 risk score. And um, uh, he's also advisor for the government of Israel. So Uri, I would hand over to you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. OK. Um, hmm, so I can't share screen yet. Oh, now I can. OK, can you see the slides also? Yes. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so I will talk about a very specific project which we did, which I think highlights how machine learning, like a, a specific example of how machine learning was impactful here in Israel in dealing with the crisis. And I will end the presentation with a small request for collaboration, which I hope might come up uh, from people uh, listening. Um, so this came out from work with uh, one of my research partners who are called uh, Clalit Health. It's the biggest health provider in Israel uh, for four and a half million people. And they have both, they're responsible for patient care in the community and in hospitals. So it's the entire journey of the patient. And they have a lot of data going back 15 years. And because of that, and because of my interest in using machine learning in healthcare, we've been collaborating with before the, the pandemic for the last two years and we have a very good relationship and we, I know their data and, and you know, we, we're, we've been working to, together. Um, so in early March, you know, the pandemic was obviously uh, already coming and Clalit wanted to build a risk score. So this is a very standard task, right? And in, in general, you just build some prediction model uh, to predict, for example, if a patient gets, is infected, what's the risk of dying? Uh, the problem, of course, that this is a new pandemic and, and that makes it hard. So specifically, they want to know for every individual who is susceptible to infection, which is basically may, maybe everyone, uh, what is the risk of them dying if they're infected? And why do they want that? Because they want, for example, to contact people who are at higher risk and tell them stay at home. And now everyone went through a lockdown, but early March, it was still not obvious where this was going. Uh, prioritize testing to people more at risk and even uh, help decide who should we hospitalize because we know that many patients do not suffer any serious disease and we knew that even back in early March. Uh, but if someone is at higher risk, maybe we want to send them to the hospital even if they're currently in a mild condition. Uh, so for all that, we wanted the risk score, um, which is again, very standard in, in healthcare. But what data did we have back in early March? So. Back then, and even now, there's not much public data and there are no models from any other country. In Israel, where we had access to data because uh, you know, we're the health provider or I'm working with the health provider, there were only a hundred patients back then. And they were mostly young and in mild condition. The early patients in Israel were people traveling in Europe and coming back, uh, generally healthy and younger people. So we couldn't use their data to see who is at risk of dying. We had data from China, but it was only univariate marginal. So China, as far as I know, hasn't released any data set, but they did have tables, like a table like this from the Chinese CDC, which for example says for every age group, how many cases, how many deaths, so you could just calculate what's the risk of dying conditioned on being in an age group. And also you could do it conditioned on being male or female, and on certain comorbidities like diabetes or heart disease, but this is all separate. So these are all univariate marginals, no joint model, no multivariate risk factors. So we don't know if there's any intersections or interactions between the different uh, uh, factors that we can see. And that was back then basically the only data we had for Corona. So what we want is a model which I denote the following, P corona, so under corona, the probability of death condition on some set of variables which define a patient, which could be very high dimensional because Clalit has very detailed uh, information. So your entire medical history and demographics and so on. And of course, 
in Israel, because maybe the disease is different in Israel than in China. We, we still don't know for sure uh, how it changes. But what we have was just these univariates of P-corona of death condition on a specific thing, age or sex or comorbidities, and from, from our perspective, the wrong country, from China. And of course, over a much smaller set of features than what we have in our data set about the Israeli population. And so no model and data from the wrong country, but still we want to try getting from what we have to what we want. And we came up with an emergency time solution, which involved three steps of how to get from, from that very poor and, and uh, how would I say sparse data to, to a full model. The first idea was let's build a model for a different disease, the flu. So I think by now everyone knows that this is not the flu and Corona is of course much riskier than the flu, uh, but we have data for flu complications. And our idea was that this would at least help us rank people in a somewhat more sensible way. If you're in more risk to get complications or even die from the flu, Possibly you're at more risk to die from Corona. It seems like not a terrible assumption. And we validate that with clinical expert, which kind of shrugged and said, yeah, that's probably true. So we could build that model very well because there are millions of, of people in the data set and flu has been going on for years in Israel. So uh, that could be easily done. But that's not the model we need. We, have, we need the Corona model. So our next step was we could lift, and, and I will elaborate about each one of these steps. So lift these univariate uh, marginals from China into some multivariate, still low dimensional, but multivariate model. So how can we take all these univariates and turn them into a multivariate model from China? And finally, we want to kind of nudge the flu model from Israel to look like the Corona model from China. So we somehow have to recalibrate the flu model to basically say, Look, Corona is riskier. It's especially riskier for this subpopulation and that subpopulation, which is what we might see from China and somehow end up with a model which we hoped would be usable. And this all relies on some hopeful assumptions, which whereas death is a, a independent of the features we have from China condition on country. So for example, given your age, sex and comorbidities, a person, a, a Chinese person, an Israeli person are in the same risk of death. That is still probably not right, but we hope it's not too wrong. Okay, so how do we approach each of these uh, three steps? So the first, this is easy, I won't go into it. This is standard supervised learning. Uh, uh, my colleagues uh, from, from Clolite, they used XGBoost for this and train test validation, the usual thing. The second, oh, the second step, how do we take univariate marginals and make them into a multivariate model? So this is in general impossible uh, unless you make some strong assumptions, which is what we did. So we assume the vector, the, the feature vectors are, are all binary. So whether you're in as an age group or have a comorbidity or not. And here we made a, a weird assumption which is we assume that the probability of dying condition on all these things in China is a linear function of X. Uh, so a linear probability model, sometimes people in econ use that. Of course, that might give you negative probabilities or probabilities which are greater than one, uh, but we needed some assumption that will enable us to do what I will show next. Uh, so how is this assumption useful? Uh, so we'll denote by mu the vector, the univariate uh, vectors of risk of death from corona condition on a specific variable. And we'll have a matrix Mij, which is the conditionals of Xj equals one, condition on Xi equals one in China. For example, uh, the chance that uh, 30, if you're 30, you will have diabetes or uh, the age and sex dis uh, conditional distribution. So how many? 70 year old, year old females are there in China. If you have this, then from the linear model assumption, you have the equation M times W equals mu. And recall that W is the feature vector, is sorry, the weight vector that we want. So we can just solve for this and we can 
take this through their inverse and just obtain some W tilde, which is hopefully close to the true W, which again is based on this somewhat unusual assumption of a linear probability model. So this will give us a very approximate multivariate China model of the risk of death condition on the entire vector X1 through Xd, W tilde transpose times X. So again, we can lift the univariate to a multivariate using this linear probability model assumption. And this required us to get this matrix M from China. And some of our students were just up all night, basically looking up data from China and from papers trying to get uh, these, uh, these conditionals from China. And of course, we also have this matrix from Israel, Israel which we can use in our data set. So this is the second step linear probability model assumption. The third step was how to kind of change the problem, fix the flu model to look more like the Chinese Corona model. And to do that, we used a, a very interesting paper from uh, Heber Johnson et al. It was in ICML 2018. It's called Multi-Calibration, uh, Calibration for the Computationally Identifiable Masses. And I will not have time to go into all the details. I, uh, I encourage you to, to look at the paper if you're interested, but it has this definition that a classifier P hat of X is multi-accurate over some family of sets, which might be intersecting. So all the sets S and C, if the expected probabilities over these sets are the same. This, this is basically motivated, or at least one of the motivations was in fairness, for example. You want to ensure that you your expected probability of uh, accepting uh, a woman uh, from Canada into some program is what, you, what it should be. And these groups could be intersecting. Uh, so that was kind of the motivation of that paper. And they showed that this is actually possible. You could achieve multi-accuracy under some conditions on the, the set of sets that you want to be uh, accurate on. Uh, so that was their main theoretical result. And the way the algorithm does this is you just change probability. So you go individual one by one and you just change their individuals, nudge them. And it, um, surprisingly enough, this converges in polynomial time. So this works under certain assumptions. Uh, so this is the result from their uh, ICML uh, paper. And we just repurposed that. And we said, okay, we now want to nudge our uh, flu model to look like the multivariate model we extracted from China. So we're gonna recalibrate this flu model to look like the Corona model. And we did it over a low dimensional marginals such as age cross sex and, and so on. Uh, and in practice, we only did this for two dimensional uh, pairs uh, for all kinds of reasons. We, we, we found we couldn't trust uh, higher dimensional uh, things in this model. So, Bring it all together, we built a flu model, so a model for the wrong disease. Then we kind of uh, extracted uh, an approximate multivariate model from, from the Chinese data and recalibrated uh, using this method from Heber Johnson et al. Recalibrated the Chinese model to look to, uh, sorry, the Israeli flu model to kind of match the Chinese model specifically noting the much higher risk of death from Corona compared with flu, but also who exactly is at more risk, relatively speaking? Okay, so this gives us some model P corona of death in Israel, um, which is what we wanted to use. Now, we made a lot of flimsy assumptions along the way. So, you know, that flu complications could be even recalibrated to, to uh, simulate corona deaths. China and Israel, we had this hopeful assumption, which might not be true. We used the linear probability model, which is pretty weird. Multi-calibration that this uh, Hebert and Johnson paper assumes that underlying P of X does not change. So we could kind of fix this, but not really. I, I don't want to go into the details. So this was very risky, uh, uh, speaking as someone who's developing now a method. We made a lot of bad assumptions. So. What did we do to kind of gain trust and, and say, okay, we can go ahead and deploy this model. Uh, first, we only used it for ranking. We said we can't trust the true probabilities. The numbers just, there's no reason they will be uh, calibrated. Uh, so it's only who's at, who's at higher risk and who's at lower risk. And 
also, we just devised a long series of sanity tests. We say, okay, we cannot deploy this before clinical experts examine the prediction on subgroups. Let's look at descriptives of all kinds of who are the highest risk people, who are the lowest risk people. How does this model differ from the flu model? So we just kind of try to uh, kind of prod this model and, and kind of stick our fingers in all kinds of places to see whether it makes sense because we had no test set. We had no way to know whether we're right or wrong. Uh, so that was our way to kind of gain confidence in this model. Um, overall, this entire thing took seven days from the, the, we, from the day we started until it was actually deployed to physicians in the field. Uh, so these are thousands or tens of thousands of physicians, thousands of clinics, millions of patients in Israel. This, of course, was a feat mostly of the IT in Clalit of just deploying such a model. Anyone who worked in, in, in such things knows how difficult it is to deploy a, a model. And it was used extensively. They called the patients, they prioritized testing, deciding who to hospitalize. It was used all around in Clalit, uh, this model. What we found, so, and, and now I want to just say a few things about deploying a model in, in the real world. It was very hard to change once deployed because we had more ideas. You say, okay, we can make this better. We only, we had seven days. Once the model was deployed, it was very hard to change. The doctors knew who their patients was. You know, I know, you know this woman uh, who I know personally is high risk. How can you change her risk now that you've updated your model because something you had a better idea. So it was very hard to change once deployed, and that was for me an important lesson. Uh, there was need for interpretability, which we didn't really have in this first iteration. There was like, if a doctor is calling a patient and telling her or him, you should stay at home, you're at high risk, they want to know why, and we couldn't really give them a good reason in that initial model. Since then, time has passed, and we can actually validate the model because now we have corona patients in Israel. Some of them have regrettably died. So we can now, in the benefit of hindsight, know how well we did. And what we found is using 3,000 Israeli patients, our AUC was 0.94, which is, I think, very high. So we could rank the risk pretty well. And actually, training a corona model directly on these 3,000 patients doesn't give a better result. Uh, and so, Surprisingly, this did pretty well. We can, in this figure we show, I compare with some decision rule about who's at risk from the CDC, which was very, which was quite useless. Uh, basically said 40% of people are high risk. Uh, and just some, some overall lessons. So desperate times led to some desperate measures. We focused on ranking and on sanity checks because we had no test sets and because the stakes were so high, I don't think I ever worked on a model which impacted so many people. The model was immediately widely used and trusted. So doctors in the field, they told them, you know, the expert gave you a model, they just took it. Uh, they didn't ask why and how, and uh, didn't ask what's, uh, what is the ICML 2018 paper relevant or not. I would be less trusting of this model than the people in the field from the reports we've got. And that is actually a source of concern for me that they just took it up. It, it, places more responsibility on our side to communicate uh, uh, the issues. The model was hard to change once deployed. In hindsight, it was fairly accurate, but I cannot in good conscience say that we knew the risk we were taking because in hindsight it was fine, but maybe one of those uh, assumptions we made was terrible and maybe we would have made big mistakes. We tried to avoid them uh, and I, I have no kind of solution for this. I, I'm just saying I'm not entirely uh, comfortable with what we did. We took a big risk. Um, okay. Uh, so just current work. So, so that's about this uh, uh, work with Clalit. They have now moved on and have better models for many reasons. Uh, they, they know how to do uh, this work. I am now working with other data sets from Israeli hospitals, much very detailed patient data set. We're working on multi-state models. And if anyone here who is listening is working on patient data anywhere in the world, I would love to talk to them about the possibility of sharing data or models uh, because I think that could be really helpful and we haven't seen much sharing going on so far. Uh, so that's uh, offline and just to, to wrap up, this project was led in the Clalit Research Institute 
uh, by Noam Barda and, and uh, Noam Barda and Noah Dagan. I have a typo here, that's Noah. Uh, the extreme domain adaptation component of this was led by uh, two PhD students, Daniel Greenfield from Technion and Galeona from Weizmann. And many, many people worked day and night to make this happen. Uh, this was really a big, big team effort from on lots of sides, mostly in Clolit. They had to do all the deployment work. Uh, and this, the paper is available on MedArchives. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time.